Hello, my name is Dr. Bruce Klein. I'm the president of Apostolic Theological Seminary. Today, I'd like to talk to you about the purpose of Apostolic Theological Seminary. Of course, we're biblically based, so I'm going to start off in the Bible. I'm going to read to you from John chapter 3, verse 5, and it reads, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man is born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Again, it's born. I want to read it again. John chapter 3, verse 5 says, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Bible, right? So that's the way. It's the plan of salvation. But it says you must do that. Or you can't enter into the kingdom of God. So that's important enough that we want to be out telling people about that. That verse is backed up by Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Acts 2, 38 says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And you, or ye, shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So these are steps. These are things that you have to do. But what if you don't know? You've got to know. And Jesus makes a big point of this, as we see in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Acts chapter 1, verse 8 says, But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. So when you get the Holy Ghost, you have power. But what are you to do with that power? It says here, And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. So it's, it's telling you to go. It's not that you have a choice. We have to go. But there's many different ways in this day and age to go. Uh, some people go by, by Facebook. Uh, the Internet has all kinds of ways to reach the world. Uh, my particular Facebook, I have people from many, many different countries. On the Internet, on our website, we, at the bottom of our website for Apostolic Theological Seminary, we collect flags. And right now, I think the last count was 113 different countries have viewed our website. On the website, we have the plan of salvation. Another way is to start schools in other countries. Sure, we have the seminary, the Bible college in the United States, but we want to reach other lands. And to do that, we've gone through and just put the website together back in 2005, and pastors from other countries would contact me back then and say, we'd like to have a, a seminary, Bible college in our country. So I turned around and sent them books. I'd send them three books to start with. Now I've written over, uh, I've published 21 books so far. I've written probably 50 books. They're not all published yet. Still publishing, still writing. But I sent about three books. So here's a stack of books here uh, that you know, I don't, not everything I've written is in this stack, but I sent about three books. Then they receive the books, start their Bible college, and they go from there. And so that's, that's important to, to be able to reach them and when they have the books, they can teach from the books. And right now we have over 50 schools. I don't have an exact number with me now, but it, it's always growing. We're always adding more schools. We have over 50 schools. I send the books out for free. Then we see the books, set everything up. So we have 50 schools. We're training over 2,000 students per week. And I don't know how many countries we're in now. We're close to 25 different countries where we have schools set up and try to reach people with the gospel, but that's important. We, we need to go, we need to be reaching them. And that's the purpose of Apostolic Theological Seminary, is to go and reach the world. Now, one place to start is here in the United States. So we have, uh, we're teaching here. We, it's set up where students call me personally or my wife, and then we teach the Bible one-on-one -on -one or in a group setting by webinar. So my wife is busy teaching, teaching weekly, teaching Hebrew. Uh, teaching biblical Hebrew, where she takes, uh, they have a textbook, they order themselves, they have their own textbook that we go through, and, and she's teaching from introductory, don't know the alphabet, up until, until you can translate for yourself the Word of God. Of course, the Old Testament is written in Hebrew, so it's important to know how to read the Word of God because it's written in Hebrew for the Old Testament. The New Testament, some people think it's written in Greek, some people think it's written in uh, Aramaic, Either way, I teach both. So I can teach you the Greek. I've written, what are these, in the stack here, I have a Greek grammar that I've written. We do Greek in a day uh, seminars. So Greek in a day is, uh, 
We teach you everything you need to know in one day. No, I'm kidding. We teach you a lot, though. We teach you the alphabet. We teach you how to read. So when you're finished, you can read the Greek words. We go through and teach you basic grammar so that you can understand some of how a noun and a verb and all that fits together. We go through, and somewhere there we're putting in words. So when you finish, uh, you can probably know at least 20 words by the end of the day, maybe more. I'm uh, working with about 75 words that we're actually working with in class. Uh, you may not know all those, but what's nice about those is you can hear that word, and if you were to hear it, if I were to say the words now, you'd say, I know that word, I recognize that word, because it's close to the English. So this kind of words, that makes it a little bit easier when you're starting off Greek to know some of that. I've been teaching for, I started teaching the Bible back when I was nine years old, and I spent a couple of years teaching high school English. I spent time teaching at a university for three years full-time, university teacher teaching English, teaching history, teaching business. I love to teach. And so uh, at our seminary, my wife and I are both called by Jesus Bible teachers. So we get in there and we want to be hearing by, from Jesus and, and teaching you the word, the true word of God. So we're not, we're not into the systematic theology, which most schools are teaching. The systematic theology means that they go back historically or they go back and they take their doctrine of their church, of their denomination, of their fellowship, and they take it and, and look for verses to support it. That's not the way I've done it. Sure, I was trained as a Baptist. I was a Baptist pastor, trained in Baptist Bible colleges, Baptist seminaries, and other schools other than Baptist, Presbyterian, other schools. And so I've been trained like that, but I realized, no, I need to go back and look at the Bible and read the Bible for what it says. Because if you're over in this group, you ignore these verses. If you're over in this group, you ignore these verses. Well, I believe you need to take the entire Bible in context and understand what it's saying and teach it. So I'm teaching the whole Bible based on biblical theology, not systematic theology. Sure, I know a lot of people think systematic theology is the greatest. Most of the books are systematic theology, but I'm teaching biblical theology. So in other words, these, verses are go these books are going through and verse by verse explaining how it fits into the different doctrines of the Bible. Like hell, like heaven, who is Jesus? Uh, spiritual warfare. Oh. That's, that's one of the students' favorite classes is on spiritual warfare. You get there and you learn how to cast out demons. But overseas, oh, I remember, I'll give you a story. I remember one time, uh, my first trip to Nigeria. I'm in Nigeria and this girl has demons. And so she ends up on the floor, rolling the floor, and their way of casting out demons was to kick her. Ah, we don't want to be kicking people. That's not, that's not the way it works. That's not what Jesus did. Jesus turned around and would communicate with the demons and cast them out. And that's what we do. We get in there. We show you how to do it. We've done it. Uh, we've got pastors around the country. We used to travel from church to church that, that have watched us cast demons out. So it's real. We do it. We teach it. You need to know how to cast demons out. Now, there's a lot of other aspects of, of studying. Um, you, of course, the first one I've already mentioned is we get to the Bible and learn biblical theology. In other words, the whole Bible, you know, we're, we're going here and here and here. We're studying end times. We're studying um, Old Testament survey, New Testament survey. We're getting there and getting a, get, preparing the students to do the ministry that they're called to do, whether it's counseling, whether it's pastoral, whether they're going to be an evangelist or an apostle or prophet, prophetess, whatever. Our, our goal is to teach them good, solid training, get them prepared to do the work that Jesus has for them to do. Oh, uh, in biblical languages, oh, uh, it, it's just so important to better pick up the Bible and read it the way it was written. Remember, the English Bible is a translation, or the German Bible is a translation, Spanish, whichever, they're all translations of the New Testament, the Old Testament, New Testament, written in Greek or written in Aramaic, depending on your, your preference. Uh, the Old Testament was written in, in Hebrew in parts, like about half of Daniel was written in Aramaic. So you've got, you've got to know those languages so you can read the word for yourself. We go through the, the English, and I'm using a, the King James Bible. We go through it and see some, some things that could have been better translated and, and if we had gone back and we had translated ourselves under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. We're going to come up with a better translation. An example would be, let me give you one example here. I'm, I'm turning to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 34. So I'm going to 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34 to give you an example. Many different examples, but here's one. It says, 
oh, verse 34 says, let your woman keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. Let your woman keep silence in the churches. Keeping silence in the churches means that they can't pray out loud. They can't sing. Silence is silence, right? So there's a better way to translate that. When you learn the Greek or the Aramaic, you go back, see what the text says, see what the Bible says at that point, and understand a better way to translate it into English or Spanish or Russian or Portuguese. But the idea is that we need to know the biblical languages, and they're not difficult. I spent my life teaching language, um, it seems like. I work for Berlitz International, uh, one of the largest language schools uh, across the world, probably. Berlitz International, you've heard of Berlitz uh, study courses, they have dictionaries, they have the translators, so I work for them. And, and so I was trained very well how to teach languages. At least I think I was trained very well in how to teach languages. But I've been teaching Greek for a long time. And there's ways to, there's ways to speed things up. Uh, the system I'm using is the way I was taught to learn Hebrew in the synagogue. You know, if you don't know, my wife and I are both Jewish, two Jewish descents. Uh, we're Christians, we follow Jesus now uh, as our Messiah. But we look, at, we look at some of the things we learned in the synagogue and we bring them into our teaching methods. And so in the synagogue, you have a certain way to learn Hebrew. Uh, when I was in, like in seminary, I, learned, I was studying Greek in Bible college and in seminary. But in seminary, I remember the first class where there's a lot of people who don't know Greek. Uh, they start off by the alphabet. And in 10 minutes, they've taught you the alphabet and they move on. And so I spent the rest of the year, you know, when I first learned Greek, I spent a lot of time trying to learn the alphabet and get it all memorized. We don't do it that way. Uh, we're going to go through and, and spend some time, a few hours, with learning how to read uh, the Greek. So that when you're finished, you can read it. Why? Because reading it helps you remember what, you, remember what the word is. You know, as far as the memory part, uh, if you can pronounce it, it helps you remember the word. So when you're reading along uh, to yourself silently, uh, at your own home Bible study, you're working with the Greek, uh, you can recognize the word because you remembered how to pronounce it as part of your training. Uh, of course, we use flashcards. Uh, flashcards are a big issue. So I make my own for some things. Other things, I can purchase them for the Hebrew and for the Greek. For the Arabic, I make my own. And, but you're going through. And as you're looking at the flashcards, you're saying, OK, what is this? Oh, yeah. Um, and you forget, maybe, and you look around. But those of you who studied languages before say, ah, oh, it's hard. I studied Spanish. I gave up. But that's, that's, there's ways to help you so that you're not so frustrated. The one thing is understand how the learning process works. It's like this. You look at this word, a Greek word. You look at it and say, ah, oh, agape, what does that mean? Oh, yes. Ah, oh, I forgot again. What is agape? Oh, oh, yeah, oh yes, it means love. What is it? And you go back and forth. Um, but the thing is, the average person forgets 100 times before they remember. That's what the studies show, 100 times. So agape, oh, what is that? Oh, yeah. So when you do this three times, you still don't remember. You still have 97 more times to go if you're average. Some people are above average. So maybe it only takes you 50 times to memorize that word. So agape, oh yes, love, love. And so you get it down quicker. But the point is, don't become frustrated after you looked at it 10 times and you still don't remember the word. That's where the flashcards, you look, do this 100 times and you have that word for life. And there's other little things that we, we help and suggest to the students. So they, when they finish their, their study on Hebrew or Greek, they know Hebrew, they know Greek, they know the grammar, and they're ready to translate. Of course, almost from the beginning, they're doing different things than translating. Because the idea is you, you, you start, with, start with easy, you start with easy translations, and you go to more difficult. But the idea is that you're translating. You're getting to the Bible and seeing what it says for, for itself. That's important. Of course, Jesus is working with you. As you're going through the Hebrew and the Greek and you're doing the translating work, Jesus is giving you revelation what it means. He does that with the English. But you should see it with the, with, the, with, the, with the Greek and the Hebrew. Now all of a sudden, you have a language, and you can use that to support yourself. You can defend your position better with the original languages. Because the original language has more, more color, gives you more understanding, gives you more of the definition of what Jesus is really trying to say. The English, we're looking at it from our own mindset, from the Western mindset. We're looking at it and saying, okay, this is what it means, but yet, normally, there's more to it than what we see. So some people start leaving verses out because it doesn't fit their theology. 
If you understand what the verse says, it all comes together. For myself, uh, for my background, I'm going along and I'm saying, this verse says this, but what I was taught in Bible college and seminary doesn't match. So what am I going to do? I'm going to go through and say, I'm not leaving verses out. You know, it's like taking your Bible and sort of tearing pages out. No, I'm going to use the entire Bible. I'm going to go through and see that verse here and see how it matches with other verses and make it, not, not me making it fit, but see how Jesus has it all come together so it makes sense. So I don't have to say, uh, I don't like that verse. It doesn't fit my theology like I used to have to do in the past. I've pastored different types of churches. I've pastored a congregational church. I've pastored a Baptist church. I've pastored a, a Pentecostal Trinitarian church. Uh, I've pastored a number of different types of churches. But there's always, with those kind of groups, there's always verses that don't match other verses. So I got into it, the Holy Ghost led me, and at, some, at one point in time, I thought I was the only person in the world that had the proper plan of salvation based on John 3, 5, based on Acts 2, 38. And so I'm, I'm prepared to go overseas as a missionary. I'm going to China as a missionary, thinking I'm the only one in the world that has the right plan of salvation. But it turned out that there are, are thousands and thousands and thousands of other people out there. There are thousands of churches that have the same plan of salvation. I just didn't know. I, I just didn't know. My mind wasn't opened up. But now it's great because I'm in a, in a fellowship now where I can look at the Bible and teach what the Bible says and it affects their theology. Why? Because they're they hold to biblical theology, a theology that's based on the Word of God, not man's theology, not man that's, most of the theology we have today have been derived from the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church teaches all this, and I think originally the Roman Catholic Church was probably right on, you know, back 200 A.D., 300 A.D., but at some point around 300 A.D., they started going off in the wrong direction, and I explained why with church history, but Origen was a major influence in people like that, that, that had teachings that were definitely not Christian, and most people acknowledge them not being Christian, and then we go off it the wrong way. Even with John the Apostle and 1 John, what was he writing? His, he was writing his Gnosticism. And I think most of the, the fundamental theologians agree that he was writing his Gnosticism, or Gnosticism had a major influence to the point we get to where we are today, and we look back at our doctrines and their foundations, and, and some of them are Gnostic. And so we want to stay away from the Gnostic doctrine. Not, not, in, not in the biblical theology, not what we're teaching. None of that's Gnostic, at least I hope not. I mean, we made an honest attempt to make sure everything's based on the Word of God, um, but there are other theologies out there that are Gnostic. We have to be careful of that, but we want to be Bible-based. And so we study the Bible, and that's what you want to do. Be good Bereans, spend time in your word, learn that.